But I go in the car park, turn the radio on, first thing I hear, Jim White. Martin Yolis left Fulham and Renny Moonstein is put in place as the manager of Fulham. <laughs> I don't know when I think about Paul to say, do you want it? Yeah. <laughs> For me, he's, Paul is a world-class midfielder. You know, he was he was the guy that linked everything together from back to front. He knew when to speed the game up. He knew when to slow it down. He was just phenomenal. If you look at the squad that we've had at the time, it was not just Ronaldo or Rooney. We had an enormous abundance of quality an enormous amount of players with a lot of experience and an, an enormous a lot of young players with unbelievable energy and talent. It was not like, if we're going to win something, it was like, ah, what are we going to win this year? The priorities were straightforward. Yeah. And that is how we worked. And he came to me and he says, Raddy, have you ever thought about writing a book of your, your time in, in Manchester United? You've been in the academy, you did the reserves, you've been working with the first team. So there's a lot really to, to, go, to go about. Um, I said, yeah, well, we could talk about it, thought about it, but it took a while before we actually got together and we actually started to, you know, to say, let's let's really make a start of it and see how it goes. So I want to give the, the readers a, an insight to say, why was that? Why was Sir Alex Ferguson so important? Why was the way that we trained so important? And how did it contribute to that success? Hello, here we are again with Manchester United Legends on Tour. And I'm absolutely delighted to welcome, on behalf of superstar speakers, the legend that is Rennie Muhlenstein. Welcome, Rennie. Thanks for having me, uh, Alan. Listen, I'm, I've been watching so much stuff about you this week in preparation for this podcast. Obviously, we're going to talk about the book, United, Sir Alex and me. But what I want to do, first of all, is, is find out about Rennie and where he came from, that young boy in Holland and, and how did he get into football? What was the journey? Was it a sliding moment or was it just a, a progression that was natural? Probably the latter, the progression that was natural. But it was, you have to understand that Holland is not the biggest of countries. Um, geographically, to see where I came from, if you've, most people know Amsterdam, have been to Amsterdam. I'm about two hours away from Amsterdam, southeast, close to the German border, very tiny village called uh, Bergen, actually captured between Nijmegen in the north, Eindhoven uh, to the west, and then Venlo to the south. And um, as soon as I, I, I was little always, my mom always used to say, as soon as you could walk, you had a ball on your feet. And I was always basically, the, the local football club was just a stone throw away. I was always there. And it was, it was most of the time the clock tower that said, you know, bing, bing, you have to go back home. But uh, that's where it started. You could only join a club at that time when you were nine years of age. I joined when I was seven. Wow. Because the coach at the time, who became a great friend of mine, mm. he, was, uh, he said, nah, you, you're too good. You keep, you, I'll give you a shirt and you play. So the first two years I played with players that were all like two years older than me, which was great because I had to be really clever. You know, physically I couldn't compete, but yeah. you know, tactically or technically I could. But um, just to then the roll on the clock, all my friends started to play football. We had a really good generation of players. Really have, I think, in that particular time, scouting was non-existent. You know, Nijmegen, NEC Nijmegen had a professional club, Venlo and PSV, but it, they just looked sort of in and around the areas. I think quite a few number of really good talented boys have never had a chance to progress to professional football. And like a lot of other kids, I mean, I wasn't any different. I had... <clears throat> I had a dream, you know, I wanted to become a professional football. It was football, 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 football. I couldn't think only about one thing. That was football. And when you get older, when I sort of turn into sort of 15, 16, I was still playing in the under, you know, under, under 18 sort of level. But I even started to coach, help a, a local coach, helping coaching kids seven and eight years of age. But after three weeks, he had to pack it in because of his work. And I had to sort of take charge. And they left me to it. But that's exactly about the time that I got introduced to the wheel curver mm. method, you know, and wheel curver's method, all based on skill development, has been the red threat through my career. So I progressed with that. I, I got his book from a bookstore in a next door village and I read the preface and I thought, you don't need to have university to understand that this guy knows what he's talking about. And I followed that, that philosophy. And eventually it has helped me to come where I got because 
I progressed. I, I did my coaching badges. I started to work in the NEC Academy. You know, uh, I did the Central Institute of Sports. A lot, a lot of talks about. I made a video, which cost me about three and a half thousand pounds. We can talk about it later. How that came about, which I borrowed the money from my brother, and eventually I ended up with working for Curver in Qatar. Yeah. So yeah, I, I've, I've, I did, did go and play at higher levels, mm. amateur levels. I did play sort of semi-professional. I think you could probably compare it with League One, League Two. Mm. Uh, very good level though. Uh, played in our own because the setup of the Dutch league was different, but it gave me a good base. And when I had the chance, I always knew that when I saw all my friends going to study and starting to go to work and do other things, <laughs> I could only think about one thing, football. I mean, how, you know, there's, not, there's only one way I'm going to make my living, yeah. is through football. And, and that, has never, that has never changed. We're going to cover a lot in this conversation. Probably an hour is not enough. But let's talk about the decision to do this book and then we'll look at some of the chapters because that dovetails nicely into, as you've just said, that that road, that journey that Rennie's taken. So why this book and why now? It's not your first one. No, I've made a, a sort of a, a coaching book before about two years ago when I got in touch with um, the owner of uh, a company called Soccer Tutor. I think they provide, they make really, produce really good, coaching books and uh, the, George, his name is, he got in touch with me and he said, listen, Renny, I believe, you know, you've, you've actually uh, purchased quite a few books of us, you know, do you like them? He says, yes, can we meet up? So yeah, no problem. And we met up and he said, listen, would you like to do a book of your own? Because all the other books, the difference is, is that they're all written by a ghost writer. Yeah. Very good, very well presented. Uh, the only difference with my book is, is that, that I did it with, that I did it myself with some help of some of their guys. But this again is a different book. Again, I have to go back to a time I did a, like a Q and A for the Norwegian supporters club years back with, um, with Lee Martin and um, Neverland. Yeah. I was there and, and also Wayne Barton was there as we know, who's wrote a lot of book, yeah. May United books. And he came to me and he says, Randy, have you ever thought about writing a book of your, your time in at Manchester United? You've been in the academy, you did the reserves. You've been working with the first team. So there's a lot really to, to go to go about. Um, I said, yeah, well, we could talk about it, thought about it. But it took a while before we actually got together and we actually started to, you know, to say, let's, let's really make a start of it and see how it goes. So it gave me time to sort of think about what do I want the book to be about and what do I want the, the readers to get out of it. And I thought, I don't want to be just to be a book about talking about the great days of, me at all, you know, at, at Old Trafford and Manchester United, so Alex Ferguson. Yes, that has to be in there as well. But I want to give it a bit more. It was that most successful period of the history of May United. Mm. And like I always have an interest in other coaches and other teams, why they are successful. Mm. I want to know, I want to give the, the readers a, an insight to say, why was that? Why was Sir Alex Ferguson so important? Why was the way that we trained so important? And how did it contribute to that success? So... Uh, why that? Why now? It's it's not really a particular time. Obviously, it gave momentum. We picked a, a publisher, uh, Reed Sport, that was very keen in publishing it. Wayne and I sat for, I think, a year and a half every Thursday or most Thursdays in a local pub in Wilmslow, and we had an hour and a half and two hours. Um, and he, he sort of helped me, you know, writing it all up, although I have to say I, I did a lot of it myself, especially when it comes to the detail of the thing. And I'm very pleased to how, how it came out. What I notice about the book, having read it, is the way that you can detail and outline something, but you make it very simple. You don't make it complicated. I mean, was that the plan? I mean, is that the way you've always worked with your coaching and your training? Yes, absolutely. I think that is one of the, the qualities that I have to make complicated things look simple. Mm. You know, and, and I think, and it's nothing else than just putting the structure to it so that people can understand the structure and especially when you see a structure that people can relate how things relate to each other and how they you know sometimes have an effect on each other or complement each other that's the reason why I've done it that's why I've always done it whilst I you know was working with Manchester United in terms of the development plan in terms of coach education parent education and etc and also working you know with 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 obviously Sir Alex Ferguson you know um yeah I think it was a a, a big help uh, in that respect, and it makes things look much easier. Mm. 
Let's go straight for it. Ronaldo or Messi? <laughs> okay, I, I, would, I thought you were never going to ask this question, but because I ended the day, I find it a silly question, and I'll tell you for why. Thanks, Renny. Because, no, because, you know, I would necessarily have to say Ronaldo because I work with him, you know, and I know him. I've, I've played, obviously, and managed against Messi, and obviously they are absolutely two all-time greats. But there's so many others. I always find the classification of world class, first of all, be used by far too easy mm. and too often because one of my parts of my philosophy was two ways, was looking at the best teams in the world, analyze their qualities, because if you know that they are the best, they're, they're, there's a reason for it. So if you know that, you then can have to say, okay, what have we got or what, what are we lacking to be as good as them? One of the qualities are the best players. So then I looked at the best players in the world, keepers, defenders, midfielders, and forwards, and past and present. And if you go through these names all the way through from Di Stefano, Puskas, Beckenbauer, Cruyff, Charlton, Best, Eusebio, Maradona, Pele, all the way up to eh, Messi and Ronaldo, and now Mbappe and all of them, there's, there's obviously a similarity what you see because all those players, in various reasons, they are better than all the rest and they make a difference. Now, come back to the... Messi Ronaldo thing, two unbelievable, spectacular players. There's a massive comparison to them because the longevity that they've got, you know, the trophies that they've won, the goals that they've scored, hardly ever injured. Uh, both won domestic prizes with, with, with the countries, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, European champion, uh, Messi, the World Cup. Different players, though. It's more of a flavour. What do you like more? Ronaldo is just a bundle of energy, dynamics, power, pace, clinical, effectiveness. And Messi is more the, the artist, you know, slow gravity, low gravity, the dribbler, the 1v1s, the, 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 the smart intelligence to, to pick somebody off, you know, in tight situations. So they're totally different. But God, how fortunate have we been to have those players and have watched them for the last 10, 15 years. Incredible. Moving on, because I know you spent a lot of time with Ronaldo and you cover that in the book, and if we've got time, we'll, we'll touch on that in a few minutes. But let's look at Ronaldo and Rooney. You were the coach. You were training with them every day. What was that like to have those two fantastic players at Manchester United under your guidance? It was fantastic, but I never thought about it. You know, at, at the time, because if you look at the squad that we've had at the time, it was not just Ronaldo or Rooney. We had an enormous abundance of quality, an enormous amount of players with a lot of experience, and an, an enormous a lot of young players with unbelievable energy and talent. That w that was the cocktail, and the key was for us to make sure that they were all complement to each other, different personalities different positions, different, different traits. But if you, if you look at it, and I go back to when Sir Alec Ferguson brought me in, the, in his office and saying, listen, Rene, um, I've moved McFeelin up to assistant manager and I want you to be you know, the first team coach. You've done fantastically well in the preseason. Blah, 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 blah. I don't have to talk to you about Huntel and the session, mm. but I like, I like to explain to you that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet to, to what, what, I, what, what would I like to see if I see the best United? If I close my eyes, and he went through a lot of things, but then he said, from an attacking point of view, I want to see them with pace, power, penetration, unpredictability. I want to see them attack with those four things. And you have to put those four things within that team, no matter what you do, whether it's a passing uh, exercise, a, a conditioned game, small-sided games, those things come back. Now, if you go back to, at that particular time, we United really were at the best, mm. that's what you saw. Mm. And Rooney provided that, Ronaldo provided that, but Nani provided that, Park provided that. Mm. The experience and the other quality came from Giggs and Scholes and Carrick. The defence, if you look at that, with Ferdinand and Vidic and Evera, it was just, it was just fitting in perfectly. When you look at the players that you've worked with, and in particular, you know, Paul Scholes, where does he sit, sort of, in, 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 in your opinion, when you compare him, like, with Gerard or Lampard? For me, he's, Paul is a world-class midfielder. If you, if, you look, if you break it down, so you've got world-class players, 
But then you're going to say, okay, who are the world-class defenders? World-class midfielders, world-class forwards. Paul Scholes is in there. And, and probably so are, so are Gerard and, and Lampard in their own right. But they're, they're different. Paul was, Paul was more of a, of a playmaker. You know, he was, he was the guy that linked everything together from back to front. He knew when to speed the game up. He knew when to slow it down. He knew when to, to play it short, keep it short distances. He also knew when to open up and hit a switch of play of 80 yards. He was just phenomenal. And, and, and in his prime, in his peak, you know, when he really had that energy to go, he was very good in getting into the box and score goals as well. But he was a really all-round, really good midfielder that gave that, that most important element when people are in position is the rhythm. And he, he created that. He controlled that. That's what good midfielders do. There's not that many around that could do that, but he could do that. It's interesting when you decide to write a book because we spoke with Yap Stam recently and he discussed his book and the problems it caused him with yeah. Sir Alex, etc., etc. Um Did you have a chat with Sir Alex? Did you tell him you were going to do one, yeah. the content? Yeah, no, absolutely. I went to, uh, I, I, I sent him a text. I haven't seen him for a while, so I, I, I obviously also knew he changed his number. Mm. And I didn't want to uh, misuse it or abuse it, or so I uh, I just sent him a text. I said we haven't been in touch for a while. I just want to come along to see you and catch up for a coffee. There's a lot of things have happened, and I want to run something by you, which I did. And he said, "Yeah, no, absolutely brilliant." This is as soon as the you know the PDF you know watermark is ready, yeah. send it to me. And at the same time, I asked him. I said, "Listen, um, I have to ask you, and you get this request a million times, but." Would you be so kind to ride a forward? Because if if you say and I can understand, don't no hard feelings, whatever. But if you don't, I don't need a forward because you are the only person that I feel is fit to ride the forward. And he says, now I'll give it my full my full attention. And he had absolutely no hesitation. And what I really really like about it, which is on the back of the book actually, yeah. he actually perfectly captured really what I want always wanted to be about as a coach. Uh, and my coaching career. Yeah, I mean, it, I thought he caught it brilliant as well, Rennie, and I thought he was very complimentary for a forward as well, which you must be so proud of because the relationship with him is there to yeah. to be seen in, in the book, but also from Man United fans. Um, when I was going through all my notes to do the podcast with you, there were so many areas I wanted to cover, and I just thought, you know something, it, the real book's going out here. There's no sort of, oh, let's do it chronologically. So... I just wanted to bounce certain things off you. Um, one of the other things I wanted to discuss with you was regarding your six years of that success. Four Premier League titles. One was lost by, I think, a point yeah. and one on goal difference. I mean, probably going to be five if Man City is going to get caught. <laughs> <laughs> Those accusations. <laughs> you get out of you, I think. Well, yeah, I hope so, both for City and, and Liverpool yeah. as well. Yeah. But what was that like? I mean, it, did, did you ever think this was going to end? I mean, you were living the dream. You're not, like United fans were living the dream. We loved it. And, and you were right in the heart of it. Yeah. No, it, it, was, it was great because I always remember when I just joined Manchester United in 2001 and I was sort of brought in to implement that skills development programme um, at, at the, uh, the grassroots level. You know, with the development centres and all this and that, the other. And after the first year, and so Alex Ferguson, fairly honest to him, he came about two or three times he came because I said, you have to come in the beginning so you see what environment we're creating, but you see the level. Then you come, like, say, four or five months after, and then you come at the end yeah. so you can see yeah. the progress. And then I had a meeting with him in May, coming to the end of the season, like a three-and-a-half-hour meeting. And basically the... The thing for me was I sort of drawn the timeline for him to when he joined Man United, all the stuff he had to do, when the success kicked in, all the success he had up to then. So that was 2001. So 2002 was, was just around the corner. As in as you remember, yeah. that was a little bit almost the moment where he was saying his goodbyes. Yeah. But anyway, what I was trying to say to him is you have created a way to be successful. The key now is to create ways to maintain that success, to carry it on. Partly of that is that we make sure that we develop kids in that academy that can meet the modern demands of the game in 10 to 15 years' time. 
none of your concern at the moment, but it's important that that's been, you know, done in the right way. And then we discussed a little bit, okay, so how do we do maintain that way with the first team? And as the, the sort of years went by, as you, as you know from the book, I started to do some individual work with Jago Forlan first, then Ruud van Istroy, right. did some stuff with Giggsy, yeah. and then they saw the benefit of that. And then the medical department actually asked me, say, listen, it's a great, great this ready, but could you, when we've got them fit, before they go back to group training, could you then do two, three or four, whatever's needed, before they go into the group? And that was an ideal moment for me to work on the player's tactical side of the game to add something to it. Yeah. So by the time I got to the first team, I mainly worked with all the players. Then for me, it was all to implement that in a game scenario, in a game situation, because I knew this is going to give us an edge. Yeah. You know, and that is what I explained to Swalik first by saying, yes, this is what needs to be done at grassroots level, but we can still improve players at first team level. Mm -hmm. Even if it's 1%, 2, up to 5, times 10, mm -hmm. your team is going to be, and that margin is going to be the difference of winning more games and therefore more trophies. Mm -hmm. That's That was our outline. And it was... Like every year, it was, it wasn't like, it wasn't amazing if you think back, you know, honestly, almost unique, but it was, it was not like if we're going to win something, it was like, ah, what are we going to win this year? And the priorities were straightforward. Yeah. Premier League, Champions League, you know, FA Cup, yeah. Carabao Cup, whatever league it was yeah. called, yeah. Shout to Shield, if we get in there, in, in that sort of order. And that is how we worked. And I think to sum it up and to really explain it is this. At the particular time in Man United, and that's not changed, but so Alex Ferguson, because of the period that he already had, he's had, May and I, the highest of ambitions. Yeah. Yeah, we want to win the Premier League Champions League and I. Because of that, you've got <clears throat> the highest expectations. And with expectations comes pressure. So you need to manage that pressure. But with those expectations to meet them come standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that you need to meet as players and as staff. And to do that, to meet those standards, you need to take responsibility as a staff, as a player. And that is how we operate. And that's why we got into a into an environment, into a flow where failure was not an option. You know what I mean? Where winning was a habit. And that was in training. I mean, in all the all the six years that I that I trained Manchester United first team, there's not been once not been once that I had or Swallowed first or anybody else had to stop the training and say, hey, boys, this is not good enough. Uh -huh. They were so self-regulated, yeah. you know what I mean? Because players amongst themselves just didn't accept low standards. Mm -hmm. And that comes with expectations. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Those four things. Yeah, of course. Did you ever feel intimidated by any of the players? No, fairly enough, no. I was first time when I walked into... into uh, Carrington, and obviously, like everybody knows, and to be fair, I also have to give a lot of credit to Les, Les Kershaw, yeah. who has basically been instrumental in, in helping me coming to Man United. But he was, a, first of all, very intelligent man, very important for everything he's done for Man United with the academy and like so many others. But Les was the first sort of contact person. He was a lovely guy and all this. And then obviously the next first person you meet was Kath, oh, you know, in the reception. Yeah. And, you know, and that was just a warm welcome and, yeah. you know, fantastic. But strangely enough, and, and one of the reasons that it was basically quite easy was because Steve McLaren mm. was the assistant at the time. And I was with Steve on the, uh, one of the licenses, right. the courses. I did with Steve like three weeks. So I knew Steve really, really well. So it was straight away. Hi, Ronnie, how you doing? Hi, Steve. Blah, blah, blah. So it goes and you're chatting away and... Yeah. But I was never felt, I never felt intimidated, I never felt starstruck in that respect. But like I said, I've always had an enormous respect for for anybody, but for, for, for people that have achieved things. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, like I go back to my time in Qatar with his manager, and I had Wim Subi as my assistant, who was from the golden generation of Ajax in 74, mm -hmm. won so many European Cups, 74 uh, and 78 World Cup final. You know, that generation I grew up with. So I've always had that respect um, towards those sort of people. Mm. When we look at the success of that time when you were with United, and obviously you talk about it in the book, if I was to say to you, put me together with all these players, these fantastic players, put me together a five-a-side team, 
who would be in the five-a-side team? That's a good one. Who would be in the five-a-side team? Well, I would have my countryman in goal because he would fill it. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's easy. Well, that was a work with him. Yeah. Um, I would have I would have Ronaldo and uh, and Giggs in there. Would you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, both of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. With him because Giggs is so good in a tight disguise. Ronaldo just fires, you know, scores goals. Yeah. That's right. I said it. I would probably, you know, I would 100% put Paul Scholes in there. Right. There's not many defenders here, Remy. No, not yet. <laughs> not yet. I need, I need, yeah, but you need and and players, you know what I mean? Because I would probably put Michael Carrick playing out from the back. Because oh, yeah. he can and defend, but he plays out from the back. Yeah. And Rio in there as well. Right. So that would be, I think, a decent five aside with Edwin, Rio, Carrick, Scholes. Wow. Giggs and Rooney. Any subs? Go on, we'll have a sub, yeah, here we go. Finesta Roy. You will always go. Yeah, 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 he will. In the box. Yeah. Yeah, always. Again, let's just have a look at a couple of things where um, the Champions League final, and you mentioned this in the book, and I was intrigued by this, where you were watching the Champions League final, United um, against Chelsea, and it, you knew that, or you got the feeling that John Terry was going to miss. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. I've got something with the... Uh, with penalty shootouts, and that my missus is getting absolutely, uh, what do you call it? Because we watched many a times when we watched and things was on, and I, we watching it, and I see somebody walk up, I said, what, he'll miss, but he score. Yeah. And the amount of times I've had it right, and we've had some, you know, a fair share of uh, shootouts with uh, the Socceroos as well, you know, to get to the World Cup. Yeah. And it's there's a preparation to it, but with that, with with the uh, Chelsea, I still remember the same thing. And I was watching it, and uh, obviously we prepared for it. Yeah, you know, so we had a good idea with the ones that were, you know, and we had good penalty takers in that respect. I wouldn't, I wasn't too worried about it, but it shows again that in those moments, um, you know, it's, it has happened before. It's happened with I and Robin as well with Bayern Munich against Chelsea. When when personal ego takes preference and the focus too much about if I'm scorer, I'm going to be the hero and all this and that the other. That's where a lot of times those penalties, key penalties are going to be missed. That was a similar case with John Terry. Yeah. The way that he approached it, walked up, you know, armband, look at this, this is my moment in glory. I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. You know what I mean? I'm just going to put it at the back of the net. And he could see himself already lifting it, yeah. you know, and all that. There's the whole focus about the execution of what actually needs to happen has gone out of the window. Right. And he slipped. And uh, I watched that. I, I watched that, obviously, from the stands. And I said to my missus, I watched this. Watch this. And uh, he missed, obviously. But more than anything, I also felt that Van der Sar was going to save the Anelka one it was. Wow. You know, like I said, you would, uh, you know, and it's really weird. It's really weird. I can't put a finger on it. And it's like I said, you're not 100% right. But a lot of times, you know, when you sort of see things, uh, the way they, they walk up, the facial expressions, mm. little things like that. Um, yeah, but it was whatever. We turned out to win, you know, and a fantastic win for United. Yeah, it certainly was. Looking at some of the, the managers you've worked with over the years, and again, you know, I want to refer back to the book, but I was, I'd never realised that you had the connection until I read the book with Sir Bobby Robson. Ah, a really strong one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that now, but I'd never put that, I'd never put it together. Really what was that like and how fantastic. did it actually come together? He was a fantastic person, honestly. I, I loved every minute of it I could spend with that person. I was in Qatar at the time. And I got to know uh, the legendary Dave Mackay. Yes. That he was my next door neighbor. <laughs> he, he was great, by the way. We used to play uh, uh, dominoes every night. Wow. Him, George Blues, the assistant, me and my wife. And he would lock the door. <laughs> Nobody leaves this place until I've won. And he was, if you don't mind me jumping in, pretty instrumental in you coming to United, was he? Yes, yes. Also there, I get to that point. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, there was um, there was a few other people uh, there, but there was a guy called Alan Jones, an English guy that 
years and years ago, did well, had a really good club run in, uh, with Blight Spartans, but was uh, being the national team coach of New Zealand, been around the world. So he was in Qatar managing the club. And then he heard, he learned that Bobby Robson was going to coach PSV, Eindhoven, and he knew Bobby fairly well. So he said, right now, I think that would be an ideal opportunity for you, you know, to go and work with him, with, with Bobby. And you know, does football, he could do something with you, you know. And he, he, I don't know, I think he rang him or wrote him a letter because mobile phones was not that much <laughs> at the time. But it ended up, it ended up for me going back to Holland at a particular time and then paying him a visit at the training centre at PSV. Yeah. And the first, the first day was really a little bit um, a sad one, really, because he came to me and apologised about how he can't do the meeting because he just heard his brother passed away. And so he had to go. So, mm -hmm. But listen, straight away he said, um, you know, next week, uh, if you're still here, come back, da-da-da-da-da. So I came back and uh, I had a meeting then. And uh, the funny thing was because he was just getting a new mobile phone and the guy was rambling on, he had absolutely no clue. And he says, right now, he says, I've just sit there listening to this guy for now and I've absolutely no clue how it worked. And it was just one of those Nokia things, you know, you're old yeah. enough. Yeah. It's a fairly easy, Bobby. He says, when the thing rings, somebody wants to get older, you just press the green button and say, hello, Bobby Robson. Yeah. And the other guy says, who well, he is. Yeah. And then you finish, you press the red button. <laughs> you see that little book there? It says, yeah, that's numbers. It's an address book. You just put the names in there, you ring, you know, um, often the people, you know, put them there, press there, you put the number, off you go. Huh. You explained it to me in five minutes. <laughs> this guy took me by no. Anyway, we talked away. There's a funny story, further funny story to it because it was taken away. And he says, the only problem I've got, I've only signed for one year. And I can't really do much in that respect. But... Uh, he says, well, we talked about, okay, what are your future plans? And he says, well, one day I hope to be the manager of Newcastle. And I said to him, I'm telling you, you will manage Newcastle, 100%. He says, as long as you think, then I might, you know, I might join you there. Yeah, 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 fine. You'll be an asset to every club. No problem at all. And um, I said, there's another funny thing about this. He said, uh, your birthday is the 18th of February, 1933. He says, that's not. Anybody can find it out. It says, but my mum's birthday mm -hmm. is the 18th of February 1933. Wow. He says, amazing. He says, do you know what the morale is of this story? He says, no. He says, you could have been my mother. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Bobby Rumson. Yeah. Oh, brilliant. And he says, yeah, oh, great. He says, I like your sense of humor. You feel out with me. <laughs> anyway, later on, move the clock forward. Yeah. I then come with Dave McKay. Yeah. And uh, I got in touch with Dave Richardson, you know, where yeah. Howard Wilkinson and yeah. all this and that and the other. And I was supposed to go and visit this, uh, you know, a symposium close to Nottingham. Mm -hmm. So I asked Dave at that time, has moved back to close to Nottingham, Buxton or something, or Burton, oh, yeah, yeah. close little place, uh, if I could stay with him. So yeah, no problem. And, uh, but two days before, Dave Richardson rings me and he says, uh, Les Kershaw, the academy manager of Man United, has been in touch with me. They, uh, they're looking for a technical coach mm. and I recommended you and they'd like to meet you. He says, yeah, fine, no problem. We find a way to do it. Anyway, I never mentioned anything about it, but until I met Les and Jeff Watson at a, a little chef somewhere yeah. in Stafford, <laughs> I came back and I said to, to, uh, to Dave, I said, listen, Dave, I just want you to know that I don't want you to do anything, but I've been talking to Les Gershaw from United Academy. I don't know if anything will happen, but if you're on, if my name pops up, at least you know what's yeah. what's happening. In the meantime, Bobby Robson was already in Newcastle. Wow. Yeah, wow. so he was coaching Newcastle. Yeah. But I never sort of heard anything back from him anyway. And uh, so I go back, I do the symposium and go back. And then three weeks later, phone rings, Dave McKay. Hi, Dave. Hi, Ronnie, how are you? Has Sir Alex Ferguson rang you? And I started <laughs> laughing. <laughs> Because he always winding me up, always winding me up. He says no, but as a matter of fact, I've just hung up on Prince Charles. <laughs> he says no, you ready? I've just been coming on the phone. I've just been talking to him. He says, Dave, have you given him the right number? Because yeah. last time I came to your house, I told you Qatar after the country code they added a five. Yeah. All right, that must be it. Anyway, let me know if he rings. Anyway, put the phone down. I thought. Yeah. Ten minutes later, phone. 
Hi, Ronnie. Sir Alex here. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Are we talking for 20 minutes, you know what I mean, etc. And he says, yeah, I uh, know that Les Kershaw have been talking to you. Um, Dave McCoy has been on the phone to you and he can't speak highly of you. And it would be great if you if you find the time to come and visit us. And I said, yeah, I've got a break. At that time, I was managing Al Sap yeah. uh, in, in Qatar, but we had a break. So I said, in January, I'm free. And uh, I'm more than happy to come and, 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 you know, share some time with you. So that was the whole story. But then the other funny thing was that <laughs> Dave McKay went to one of these legendary dinners where Bobby Robson was there as well. Yeah. And uh, Dave said to Bobby, he says, you know Reddy Mernestein, don't you? He said, yeah, yeah, lovely Dutch chap. You had a chat with him. And said, I know, yeah. He says, he's gone to Manchester United. He says, you're kidding me. Really? Oh, I made a mistake there. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant, Remy. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah, and then on and off, I've met Bobby a few times at a pro license and chatting away, and they're really good. Yeah. A couple of random questions. Um, you've worked in quite a few countries all over the world. Mm. Where's been your favourite place? I would still say England. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've, I, if you think about it, I've left Holland 30 years ago. Yeah. And we moved to Qatar. And at that time, Qatar in 93 was, was absolutely nothing. It was just, you know, it was just sand and run-down buildings and, and nothing else. Only after the, the coup in 95, that's when they started to go. And we had a wonderful time there. It, it really, that, that really where I started my professional coaching course, you know, with wheel curver and then yeah. I managed two teams and, it went really successful. When it came to, to England, we've settled in really, really well. I, mean, I have to say that credit to Manchester United and the club and everybody who helped us settling down because I always felt, you know, the sooner my family settles down, it's easier for me. Because yeah. if you have to leave your house and there's a problem, you know, you constantly are thinking about that and it's no good. But people kept asking me like a month later, two months later, three months later, have you settled down? Have you settled in? Yeah. And I would like, I would look at him like, what sort of question is that? I settled in after two weeks. Yeah. It, it was amazing. Wow. Plus the fact it helps that, you know, my English is yeah. decent. You know, you can communicate, you, you know, the sense of humor. Yeah, we banter, understand the banter, banter. Yeah. You know, so no, it's, it's been a great place. And like I said, we've, we've loaded here. We, we still do, you know, otherwise we wouldn't have been here. But there's been other really interesting places, but England by far, because all the other ones had, I think would say other other challenges. Ronaldo leaving United. What were your thoughts on that? It was coming. Everybody knew it was coming. Did he stay an extra year? He did. Ferguson managed to um, to convince him. And I still remember, I still remember Paul Skull saying to uh, to Ronaldo when they decided to stay for another year. He says. Uh, Honestly, we're so grateful, Cristiano. You, you, you can wear the white bib, you know, the whole year. Like, you yeah. know, you can go to Real Madrid. Yeah. But he was brilliant. I mean, he didn't sold. He was. It was. It was talked about. It was dealt with. He didn't throw his dummy out of the pram. He was outstanding. Uh. So we knew it was coming. And to be fairly honest, because we knew it was coming, we didn't sort of. It didn't come as a surprise. But also, we had time to think about. Okay, what's next? Mm. And what we knew straight away, the manager McFeely and myself thinking about, okay, how are we going to take this forward? It's very simple. We have to spread the goals. Simple. More people. So we have to sort of, you know, um, add things to our game that we are, you know, become even more unpredictable because we're going to have different players adding up, you know, ending up in the box and coming to the end and scoring goals, which we did. We started obviously playing Rooney in a different position. He had a fantastic season, you know. So it was for us just another another dimension, but it was great to see that we didn't dip really. We just carried on. What were your thoughts when decisions were made about your role at Manchester United? You know, we, we I mean, we've heard different conversations, different interviews that you've done about um, David Moyes coming in. Not, if you like, I know you've had, co you had conversations with them, but t tell us how that all worked out that you didn't stay. Because I think a lot of the fans always think that yourself and 
Mickey should have stayed for the continuity, but it never happened. Was, no. was it ever on the table? It was, initially, because inevitably we didn't make too much out of it, because when we got told by Sir Alex on the Wednesday morning, you know, he was, was understandable and, and the reasons why, but basically we got told, he says, obviously we've decided to, to bring David Moyes in, and David Gill and I had a really good conversation with him and uh, also explained how important that you guys have been you know, with the background, the staff and the rest of the staff and all this and the other. So most likely he's only gonna bring uh he's only gonna bring Jimmy Lumsden. Great, no problem at all. So for us it was still end of April, a lot of games to go. That meeting didn't take longer than you know, because I can still remember Eric Steele uh, asking the question, What does it mean for us? Mm -hmm. And he says not much really because we we explained David how important it is to make sure that we keep that continuity going. But you never know, and uh, obviously we just carried on week to week, game to game to game, and obviously at that particular time, David was also starting to get his feelers out and with the club, and he, he would have different kind of conversations with different people, so he did with me, because so Alex asked me at one point when I was in his office, he says, David likes likes to see you, have a chat with you, and uh, I explained him what your role was and what you've done, and uh, he's keen to learn from yourself. Fine, no problem at all. Anyway, so I went to his house and we had a like a two and a half hour meeting or something like that and I did my bit, he did his bit. And when I left I just sort of felt this can only go two ways. He's whether really takes on board what I said and, and takes advantage of that. Or he he takes note of it but still pushes in his own direction. And by the second meeting, that was a week later, so in the meantime he had chats with David with uh, Eric Steele, with yeah. Hank Feeling and all of them. And, that, and that's where I learned, oh, changes are going to take place. Mm. You know, we're not going to keep Mick on and Eric Steele bring Chris Woods in. And I was like, oh, there's a, a bit different as things are told. So basically I said to David, you know, at this moment in time, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, this was the picture that was painted to us. And then this moment in time, I get the feeling that you want to do it your way with your people. No, no, but... I, I like to obviously keep you on and this and that and the other. He says, but I know from Sir Alex Ferguson what you've done because you were important doing all the training sessions and a lot of preparation. I'm going to do that all myself. Fair do, it's up to you, but why do you need me then? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it was like, I got caught like, I says, but I kept saying to him, David, please, you know, just realize what you're getting yourself into. Look at the opportunity that's in front of you. Let the people that know all this help you and find your way in, find your feet, you know, in. Now, unfortunately, he's, he's decided more. And it was, it, I got caught into a situation where are you going to be pushed or do you jump, mm -hmm. basically? You know what I mean? Um, because I, I told him, this is, you know, obviously uh, I knew a little bit about how he works and that was totally different from what, how we used to work with the players that we've had. Because when you work at the top level, see... The thing, the difference between working with top, top level and top level players is this. When you, when you work at a lower level, you need to keep coaching them and you need to keep uh, reinforcing certain things. With top, top level, it's all about them taking responsibility, empower them, inform them, facilitate, and then give them the opportunity to, you know, to do their own bit. So you're not really coaching in a traditional way, like stop, stand still. That doesn't happen. You know what I mean? You just create situations. You say, hold on, guys. Fantastic. That worked well. This, what do you think is better? Well, we do this, we do that. It's a completely different approach. So I thought to myself, mm, I, I, I sort of, that this is not going to go well. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it's a different, total different kind of, of management, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and coaching. And that's why so Alex Ferguson was so big in terms of, you know, in delegating a lot of stuff to us without losing control, but also trusting, mm. trusting the staff and trusting the players that if we do everything right, it's now time for you guys to take responsibility. We empower you. We've done everything for you guys. Off, off you go. And what that, that does, it enhances the creativity. Because if you keep players constantly telling them what to do, they only think about, I need to do the right thing what the manager wants. But if you create a way and an environment where they can express themselves where they're very clear on what the jobs are from a defensive point of view, whether there's more structure to it, more jobs and responsibility. But from a, a possession point of view going forward, listen, guys, this is how we can break them down. These are the options. 
off you go. Show us. That's the total difference. But yeah, eventually it's 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 a shame that it did break down because it was the the hardest decision. I can still remember a friend of mine saying, "Listen, it'll take you more than two years to get that out of your system." I says, "Nah, you just move on. That's football." But he was right. Yeah, yeah. Well, looking at the stages after that and the managers, give us a little critique of all the people who followed in Sir Alex's footsteps to be the manager of Manchester United, starting with David. Yes, well, <clears throat> David, like I said, it was such a shame, really, because if, if, you, if the ideal scenario would have been David would just come in with maybe by himself, doesn't matter, because he needed to start to trust us. Yeah. But it was like, David, just sit at the back and we drive the boat. Don't worry about it. You know what I mean? You don't have to basically, don't do anything for six months. Learn. learn just, learn. just learn. Yeah. Just, just learn and then feed your way in, you know, because how things are done. And because that wasn't the case, he thought straight away, he wanted to put his authority in there. This is me and this is that and this and that. And when things are then suddenly are different and you know how it goes, yeah. players will start to question it. And then it starts to sort of break down bit by bit by bit. Should he, should he be given more time? I believe because I think every manager, I've, had, I've been hit with that stick many, many a times that you didn't had it, haven't had enough time. But then there's other powers that start to take place, you know, circulating around the whole thing. And then obviously people get a little bit nervous and ownership gets nervous and Chase need to make. He wasn't basically ready to manage the size of the club in May United. And that was the bottom line. So we bring in a big hit. Yeah. And Louis van Gaal. What were your thoughts on that at that point? You're wherever you are, and you'd say, "Oh, Louis van Gaal's been brought in from a, a fellow countryman's point of view." What was well, that? I'll be very straightforward with you. He's never been my my favourite. Never been my cup of tea. Mm. If I compare that to the way that what a gentleman Swalid Ferguson was and always have been, yes, very competitive. It's all about winning, hard and strong and all this. But bottom line, top person, Bobby Robson, exactly the same. I don't like people that try to look stronger by belittling others and bringing other ones down. And what I always felt, and I knew that was going to happen, I don't think he showed enough respect for what the Premier League was, for the history, the culture, and identity of what Man United was, because I knew, because the football resulted into, yes, it was all possession-based, we were keeping the ball, 900 passes, two shots on goal. You know what I mean? That's not what United is about. You know what I mean? So I knew that would because he'd done it in other clubs. But it was just, it's always been Van Gaal's way, you know, not, nothing to do with Man United. It's Van Gaal, Man United, Van Gaal United, whatever you call it. So, no, I thought it was a, it was a wrong choice from the start. Mm -hmm. I really thought. And, and for me, it was, that was, you know, something that was not ending, ending well. Um, then Jose comes in, which again is, is, something that I knew that he was very keen on and doing before because he was, in, in, in that respect, very good relations with So Alex. They, all, they were taxing them a lot, you know, this and the other. So he's probably hoped that he could jump in after. Yeah. So Alex, that has never happened. So he basically came in a little bit later to the back door. But what really, really surprised me because this man has won trophies. You know, he's managed massive clubs. You know, so you think that is not a problem that wouldn't phase him. But what really, really struck me that for, it must have hit some kind of a nerve because I saw a manager there that it almost looked like a burden to manage May and I. Mm. You know, he was sort of had a very miserable kind of, you know, where you need to be, you always need to show your, your pride. You know, you, you represent the fans more than anything. You represent you know, May United, the club, the brand. And for some reasons that has broken down in the background that he wasn't happy about. Maybe that he didn't get the control that he wanted. You know, I, I don't know. But again, the hardest thing, Mourinho's all about winning. Just winning. Don't care. No matter It cost. doesn't matter how. He just uses the player for it. It doesn't, doesn't matter how. But with Sir Alex Ferguson and the, the culture and identity he created, yes, it's all about winning, but in a certain way. Mm. And we've got an obligation to entertain. And that is what we're going to do. So we are going to be, and that's come back to what I said, the ingredients, space, power, penetration, unpredictability. 
That's in there, you know what I mean? And the hardest thing is for Man United is to win, is to win, to be successful and play in an attacking, attractive way. That's the hardest combination you can find. And we've had that at that particular time. Not, not every game, mm-hmm. but most of the games. Because that was because some of the biggest compliments that I felt in those six years when I met fans from other teams that were saying, well, Rene, I'm, I'm, I'm not a Man United fan at all. Absolutely, I hate them. <laughs> but to be fairly honest, you play some good football. Yeah. I love to watch you play. Yeah. That's a big compliment. But that's a similar now, you know, when you see other teams play, you know, when, you know, Liverpool plays great or City or Arsenal, whatever it is, that's just the love of football that you got. But that that's where, again, Mourinho got stuck. And then he basically completely destroyed the relationship with the fan base. And that's the last thing you want because the, those are the first ones you need, yeah. you know, to back you up and give you that time and keep going and do well. So then to follow up with Ole, Ole Gunnar was... A sort of a, a sensible choice to say we bring somebody in that the people can resonate with, and he knows what the club's about. He knows what the expert, he knows the ambition standards, mm. ac- expectation standards, responsibilities. So he knows that. Was he was he ready as a manager to do take a club so far? Probably not. But he knew the club, and initially it was only for a short period of time. Mm. But because everything sort of went well and people were happy and all that, well, let's give him a long term. A long-term contract, and then the the key is the most important thing. Then is is that have you got all the attributes to making sure that now have you got the vision to to make sure and the strategies to get United established in that short term and long term. Short term, he did it. Now, can we push through? Yes. And then you had that constant, the constant level of inconsistency that was there, you know what I mean? You had some great performances and again it was there. And that has not disappeared. It's still there now. You know what I mean? Man United, yeah, great performance, whoop, off we go again. Does that upset you? Yes, of course it does. Of course it does, but it is too, it's too drifted too far away, you know, like it has absolutely no, zero resemblance of in the time that we have, what we had, none. And, and the fact that the constant unrest that is, you know, driving, so somewhere, Somewhere down the line, there is still that that cloud that you know over the past. You know what I mean? Oh, so Alex Ferguson and all that is still is still there and hanging there and the success and you know because Rio, uh, Gary Neville, uh, yeah. the Skulls, Owen Hargreaves, the old the pundits, you know they fuel that. Then you got the, the the massive uncertainty and the unclarity and you know the troubles with the Glazers and the ownership that's there. Where, where is it going to go? You know and whatever all all the problems that take that. And then you got a misfiring, a, ma- a malfunctioning team on the pitch. So it's it's a cocktail and a re- you know, recipe for disaster, really, which 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 we're at. Whereas every team, every organization drives on two main pillars: stability, continuity. So so Alex Ferguson, when he started, he had a rough time to get it all going. But when we had it all going, that never the stability and continuity was always there. And continuity has to do with the vision. How do you see your team being successful now, in five years' time, and beyond? The stability is with the people that put that into place. So making sure that you got the right people around you with the right expertise, the right experience, and the longer they are together, the stronger it becomes. And that was exactly what Sir Alec Ferguson has. Now, the first thing that goes was this. So stability is gone. So then you start to wobble like this table. <laughs> You know, what I mean? all the way through it, and that's it, hundred yeah. percent. And that's hard to get back. That's well, hard to get back. You, I mean, we can see the love that you have for United. We can see the passion and, and dedication you have. It's there in the book, and that success that you had. What were your thoughts when they brought in a sort of caretaker manager, Ralph? I mean, what, what, what did Again, it's like. Um, did you know him? I know of him. I knew of him. Yeah, I've actually been indirectly been in in, in touch with him. Because I always keep an eye on, on on things that is happening outside. You always make sure that you keep up to date and learn if there's anything different than news. But um, but again, it was one of those, um, you know, who knows who, you know what I mean? And you know, let let's bring let's bring this professor in, you know, and see. And the only thing what he's done is he's came into a difficult situation. Probably again a little bit of a, a toxic environment, but then when you come in, you want to give everybody a clean, you know, a chance, a clean sheet, which is impossible. 
because the relationships have been damaged so far and you try this, that didn't work, so and you fall back to the same thing, back to that inconsistency. The only thing that he has done, obviously, at the time that he was there, he had a, a really good chance to make a thorough analysis to to what what needed to happen. But I think the biggest thing is is that organizational and structural there are some really really problems there because like I said the direction has to come from from a, from above and be aligned from with the manager. I give you a simple example now. Um Unai Emery goes to Arsenal it's not a success for whatever reason. Mm. Yeah, he, he being a successful Seville, he goes back to Seville again it's a success. He now comes into Aston Villa. He knows obviously the Premier League because he's been there before. But why can a man in a such a short period of time get everybody aligned, play in a very attractive and successful way? Why is that? There's only two reasons. Because he, he is the one that gives that clear direction to the players and the squad, obviously what he wants. And he has the backing from what he needs the backing for, whether it's the director of football or a sporting director or whatever it is, and then the owner. That's it. Short lines and all this. That's the only way to do it. And it's the same with Hans Postecoglou at Tottenham. Although he had a few indifferent results, but he's been very, very clear how he wants to play. That's Tottenham. They don't gonna they they're not gonna change, they're not gonna differ, and they're gonna they're gonna cop it a few times, which they've had, mm. but if play the same way. And there's direction, there's clarity, there's a there's a clear path. So the only thing he needs to do now is is that if he sees gaps in the squad that those players are not really fitted for me to how I want to play. He needs the backing of Levy and the club to make sure those players come in and he will, off you go. Obviously, every every single journey of that rises or falls with the results because if, if he still plays in an attractive way but doesn't get any results, again, the powers will start to, to go. But what I'm saying is every manager, in my opinion, when he goes to a club, they need about 18 months. That's when you really see the hand and the direction because when you take over, it's not really your squad. You take over. So you come in as a new manager, you tell them what to do, you look at what you've got, and you see how close or how far you are with what you want. Then you've got the, the first transfer window and you can see, depending on the support of the club, what you can bring and what you can't do. So then you go into the next phase and then you can see where you are. Now, if you look at that Eric Ten Hag, mm. not bad. Not bad at all. Winning the uh, the Carabao Cup, getting to the FA Cup final, getting to the Champions League, third in the league, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Although about a few points behind. But overall, first 12 months, great direction, da 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 da. Then now this year, now there's 18 months, and, and instead of pushing through, they've done that. And then you question, okay, where 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 is that? Because where now is now you actually need to see the real. Man United coming through through the eyes of Ten Hag. And I know how we would want him to play. Mm. I know that because I know that from Ajax. Mm. Possession based, high energy, high intensity, press everybody, da 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 da. But you haven't got the players for it. You know, I had a lot of injuries, hasn't it? But then you have to ask yourself, okay, where's all those injuries coming from? Because mm. are they all impact? Yeah. Are they all coming through games? Or are they coming through maybe overtraining? All the games, program, whatever it is. Yeah. So you need to look that into the into the right perspective because that's why at the time that we were at United, we always used to manage the team high energy years, yeah, and and experience. So players thirty and above. So we would manage them physically completely different than the high energy years. They could train more, they could a bit longer, but the other ones that we knew that we needed in the games for the experience, it was just making sure we ticked them over. And they did certain things, but then we took them out, we protected them. And that that was a big thing for us. Tony Strudick, with his strength and conditioning team, did a fantastic job. Because mm -hmm. that was key for us to making sure when you get to February, March, April, you need to get your best players fit. When we look at your career as well, management-wise, you, you've managed it at a few places. Um, any regrets about going into management? I mean, the Premier League, Fulham? No, well... Regrets. I, I, on a I couldn't. Basis. I couldn't have any regrets because it was put in place without me knowing. Mm. The funny thing was, the story went this. So after it decided that I wasn't continuing at Man United, I promised the president of the Qatar Football Association, Sheikh Hamid, which I was good friends with, because he was trying to bring me back a few times. And I said to him, "Listen, when I ever going to leave Man United, 
you'll be the first one to talk to. So I'll have a chat and see where we come. They were obviously uh, already then in preparation for the World you know, for the World Cup. We had some organisations grown to massively. They had some good guys in place. And I was sort of, you know, they wanted to bring me in, but I was still keen in being involved and coaching and all that. Yeah. And that job wouldn't, wouldn't give me that. Then in the same time, around that time, Fulham started to knock on the door. You know, listen, you know, you know, if Martin Yor likes to bring you in and have a chat and Fulham and give me a chance to have a look at it, look at the squad. And I felt, you know, obviously good, good, good players, but a lot of players were 13 and above. Mm. Some are quite a few over 35s. So many players were running out of contract. Then I thought, mm, not too sure about that anyway. So I just left it for, for a little bit. Then there was the Nuremberg that came, came through the back door. That was one, in my opinion, one of the biggest mistakes I made, not taking that. Right. Because, and that's my person, how I am, because that's just the loyalty, the loyalty kicking through. Because I hadn't yet finished with Qatar. You know, they needed an answer now where I only could have given it, you know, the week after. Yeah. So they said, well, we have to carry on. So, but I should have basically, in hindsight, I should have taken that. Then Goose Hidden came because he was with Anzi Machatskila and one of the guys contacted me and I spoke with Goose and listen, I love to bring you in. And I've always, every time I met Goose, we always had great conversations, fantastic. He says, I just want to bring you in. We work exactly the same as you did with Sir Alex. I take a little bit of back step. We talk about tactics and all this and that and the other, but you do the training sessions and all this and that and the other. And that was, and obviously a great experience. And we had an unbelievable group of players with Eta O, Diara, that played for Real Madrid. Big Samba, yeah. you know, the defender, Basufa, William. Yeah, absolutely great team. But within two weeks, the first two games, <clears throat> Hiddick was out the door. And again, I, I, got, I got put in place. I got put in place. And, uh, you know, again, th there's a whole story to it as well. But that, that went sour after 16 days. And then actually after that, Fulham came. So with, with Martin Yol. Yeah. And um, I remember we played, we played uh, the first home game against Swansea and we narrow, narrowly lost. Played away to West Ham away. Berbatov couldn't play, he was suspended or injured. Actually did, had a really good game, really good first half. But in a spell of 20 minutes in the second half, he conceded three goals, so we lost 3-0. Anyway, next day is normal. The players that haven't played for 30 minutes or the ones haven't played, they train. So I worked with him and trained with him. So just after lunch, I told him, I says, Martin, is there anything I need to do? Otherwise, I just nip on the cross of the road uh, to the DFS. I need to get some furniture for my temporary house. Well, have. Yeah, fine, no problem, you go. But whilst I was there, I looked at the phone and missed the call from Alistair McIntosh. You know, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. What was the chief exec? Or? Chief exec, yeah. Missed call, not a missed call. No. And I knew there was somebody else coming in, so I rang him after I'm on, on the car park. No problem. So I sorted it all out and this, that, the other. The funny thing was... The, the 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 salesman, he actually said he's I know you. He said, oh yeah, what from? But you you say you are you a football fan? He said, yeah, I love Man United. Well, I said, well there you go. The problem seeing me next as well. Fantastic, best discount I've ever got. <laughs> anyway, but I go in the car park, turn the radio on. First thing I hear, Jim White, Martin Yolas left Fulham and Randy Mullenstein is put in place as the manager of Fulham. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what the call it. to say. No. Do you want it? Yeah. <laughs> so I rang Alistair McIntosh and he says, uh, yeah, you don't have to say anything because I've just heard it on the radio. I says, do you not think that this should be discussed and do you realise why I was so reluctant to actually join Fulham? Come to the tell and I'll explain your reasons why, which I did, you know, about, you know, so many players over 30, yeah. so many players running out of a contract. So I could envision the problem yeah. what we had. Plus the fact, the 13 games that I was in charge in Fulham, right? obviously, eventually, you do take it, it's great and fantastic. But was I ready for it? Probably not, because I hadn't, my hand wasn't mm. ready for it. In hindsight, I would have now know much more what I would have done. But at that time, I got sort of thrown in. Games came thick and fast. Every week, midweek, week, midweek, mid cup games, the whole lot. Yeah. 13 games, I think it was, I'm not sure, 13 games. Yeah. And 10 of them were in the top 10 of the Premier League. So they're all, they're all massive, challenging games. Yeah. Not that we did do badly, but it was a bit huff and puff. Mm. You know what I mean? Win a game, draw a game, lose, 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 draw. 
you know, win another one. It wasn't, it didn't heal up. But I thought to myself, not, not to worry. If we can stabilise, we bring the right players in January. The last 10 games of the league, there was only two in the top, let's say in the top five. Yeah. So, you know, you know how it goes. A few wins, a few draws, you get out of it. Yeah. And I was confident as well, because especially in that week where they decided we played actually Old Trafford here, May night at Old Trafford, 2-2 two, two draw. Yeah. 365,000 crosses. <laughs> <laughs> and Dan Bird had them all away. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, we should have actually been 2 nil up at half time. Yeah. Because Kieran Richardson, I remember the yeah, chance yeah, of Kieran yeah, had. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, United came back in 2 2, but then Darren Band scored uh, at the end 2 2, which was great. And then we had Liverpool three days later. Again, fantastic game. 1 0 up, 2 1 up. Fluky goal that we get to 2 2, and then in the 93rd minute, we got a penalty against us. Absolutely stupid penalty. I still remember, I said, with Rito, who was an experienced player, he was on the sideline, he was going nowhere, just don't do anything. And if he does anything, trust your goalkeeper and the defenders. So anyway, bang, penalty, 39, 93rd minute, bang, we lose 3-2. That was then, we had 10 days off. The only time we had a breather. Mm. So basically, I wasn't even able to coach the team in a proper way, because you had no time. You play, you recover, you, you, you wait, you prepare, off you go to the next game. So that was the sort of cycle. And then I heard, out of nothing, you know, end off. And I was really bitter about it. I really was, because like I said, they never really, first of all, asked me if I wanted a job. Then you try to do, you put your heart and soul in it. And then, and then more important, what, what even more upset me was that when I, and part of the whole thing for me coming is that the owner, uh, uh, Shahid Khan, he actually flew me. I actually flew all the way around the world because it was in Dubai, Hong Kong. He flew me from Hong Kong all the way to Jacksonville. All the way to Jacksonville. And I had a chat with him and all this and that and the other. But his right-hand man, I forgot his name, Mark. We were sitting in a car at one point. We were driving. And I asked him, why does Shahid actually wants to buy Fulham? He's obviously had his ja uh, Jacksonville Jaguars uh, American football yeah, team. Yeah. And obviously they wanted to. And he says, now we actually want to buy uh, Everton. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, look. Why didn't you do that? Because Everton, to be fairly honest, new stadium, big, big catchment area, you got more of this and that. Area. Well, we were actually right. We were ready to sign the papers. And then we found out that Everton was in Liverpool and not in London. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we bought for them instead. And honestly, I nearly fell out of the car. <laughs> and that's the people you deal with. Yeah. And you think to yourself, and that's what I'm saying, is that that's when you get these sort of knee-jerk knee -work reactions and emotions, which... It's a shame, really, but here we go. Ready, listen, it's absolutely flown. I mean, we've not even talked about Australia. I mean, it's <laughs> been absolutely brilliant, but it's been a pleasure. Thank you for being open and honest, and that's why Manchester United fans will always love you. Thank you. Renny Mealers. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Remember to tune in to the Man United Legends podcast on a weekly basis. Click the link below and subscribe to our channel.